We, we are so much more than citizens of the United States of America. We are so much more than people who live in a physical world with temporal bodies and everything else. We are citizens of an eternal kingdom. We are citizens and ambassadors of a spiritual, heavenly, eternal, unshakable kingdom. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church Podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today, and we pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. Okay, we are coming to uh, toward the end of Hebrews. Um, we've, we've been in it since January, and we will finish it uh, just before Thanksgiving. And so we've got a couple weeks left. We're finishing off chapter 12 right now. And um, as, we, as we get into this, um, I just it, I love how God lines all these things up that um, uh, as we're going to talk about so much of, of what it means to be the people of God and what it means to be the church in this day and age, um, that that happens to line up with the day that we set the all-in class for. And we didn't set the all-in class for today thinking like, oh, that's what the message is about. This will work up nicely. It just happened. To, and as I've been like processing all the stuff for the all-in class, totally come, hang out. Even if you're just like no idea, and you're like, I don't know about this church. Maybe I'll check it out. It's going to be like probably a half hour and we'll start like 20 minutes after church. Okay, so just come hang, um, drink some coffee and then hang out and find out what it's about. And maybe you're like, I need to be all-in. I don't know. But as we are looking at, um, at, at this section of Scripture, man, it just, it speaks so much to what church is really about because it's not about finding somewhere to attend. It's not about um, finding something to watch or, or getting on YouTube and making sure you see a really good sermon um, each week. There's nothing inherently wrong with those things, but if that's all it is, that's not enough. It's kind of like, you know, as long as you're eating healthy, it's kind of like chocolate cake, uh, unless you're grain free like me, and then no chocolate cake. But, um, but I love. B- before I realized I shouldn't eat bread, um, I love chocolate cake, and uh, I would definitely, if there was cake, I would eat more than one slice if that was available. Um, I like cake. You can't just eat cake. Anyone ever make that mistake? Like my kids, I'm pretty sure uh, since uh, Halloween, uh, I'm, I'm not the only one in our family, but uh, I, so I'll say me too. Yeah, uh, <laughs> as my, my mom is holding up the candy bar that one of my kids had on the chair for this morning. Oh, okay, one of the other kids. Okay, it's sort of like one of my kids. Uh, so, uh, and I've had more than one Snickers pre-noon uh, in the last few weeks. Yeah, I know. It, it's not great. You can't live on Snickers. Like, technically, you can. You can get enough calories to survive, but it will quickly start killing you. You'll get, like, you're going to end up with, like, modern-day scurvy. You know, you eat just nothing but candy bars. There was a kid in the U.K. that ate nothing but potato chips. He was a gamer kid. He was a teenager. He ate nothing but potato chips for his whole diet, potato chips and the occasional French fries. And he refused to eat anything else. And I don't know, like, why his parents allowed this to happen, but he just played video games all day long and ate nothing but potato chips. He went blind. He ended up with like a salt toxicity and a complete lack of like beneficial nutrients in his life. And his body started shutting down and it started by turning his eyes off. I think probably somewhere in his physiology, his body decided, you know what? Staring at that idiot box is really ruining your life. I'm going to take that one away and boom. And there they go. So, and I think at least some of the damage was permanent. And so, like, you can't live on just like the fluff, just the 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 sauce alone. You gotta you gotta have the whole thing. Like little chocolate cakes, all right, but make sure you get some protein and some greens and that kind of thing too, right? So there is a superficial and and a deeper reality to many things in scripture, almost everything. There is a physical world we live in, and surprisingly, this is the temporary vapor that will fade away. This is the stuff that's going to crumble and fade, and and ultimately, God is going to remake. He's going to reform, reestablish, redeem the earth, and um, not 100% start over like with the flood, but 
he's remaking creation because he made this for us and he's going to reestablish his kingdom for us. But in a permanent way, in a way that does not fade or rot or crumble apart the way that our physical reality does. So in Hebrews 12, starting in verse 18, we're going to read through it and then we'll, uh, and then we'll talk through it. It goes like this. It should be on the screen with me as well. Feel free to read along. It says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they, effused, when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship our God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Yeah, it's too bad we don't have a good word to preach today. Okay, um, man, you guys, I, I don't know if you caught that, but we, we are so much more than citizens of the United States of America. We are so much more than people who live in a physical world with temporal bodies and everything else. We are citizens of an eternal kingdom. We are citizens and ambassadors of a spiritual, heavenly, eternal, unshakable kingdom. We are people of an other place. And so because we come from this other place, because our home is in this other place, let us not be like those who rejected that king and forsook his blessings. Let's be people who in reverent awe and worship, like the the song we're singing, like, show us your glory, Lord. And we're going to hear about that. And like thinking about that song, thinking about these texts, it's a little terrifying, a little humbling. Because it's such a big thing. It's such a, a terrifying and wonderful thing. It, it's, I mean, have you had, have you experienced something like that that is so amazing? It's, it's horrifying at the same time. Like it, it's so good, it's scary. Or it's so immensely terrifying that to recognize that it's also good is just the absolute best news ever. Mm. there's a parallel here uh, from Paul who didn't write Hebrews, but he wrote Galatians. And um, uh, Paul in writing Galatians talks about um, a a parallel kind of concept to what we just read in Hebrews. And I want to, I want to read it to you here. It's uh, Galatians 4, 21 to 31. I just got to get the right page here. It's about Hagar and Sarah, but it's not about Hagar and Sarah. Paul's writing to Jewish believers, Jews who have become Christians. They acknowledge that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And he says this. He's talking about how we have become children of God, how we've all been adopted in. And he's kind of tearing down the walls of like, you know, just just a little while ago, he said uh, a pretty famous uh, verse that gets quoted a lot that like, there's neither slave nor free or Jew nor Greek or male or female or anything else. It's just all are one in Christ. Um, in verse 21 of chapter 4 in Galatians, Paul writes, 
Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? That's not the important part of what we're reading right now. But he says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, meaning if you remember, we talked about uh, some of this um, as we talked through Hebrews 11, uh, born according to the flesh because it was a denial of God's promise. God said, I'm going to do this thing through you and Sarah. And Abraham looks at his wife, Sarah, and he goes, I'm old, you're old, super old, not having kids, don't know where that's going. So I guess God was wrong, but I have this mistress, this slave, you know, your servant, I will, you know, and she goes here, well, have a baby with my servant. So you can still have this blessing of a child that God has promised. And so they do that but it was a choice of flesh. It was a choice of turning away from what God had had for him. And it was a turning to making it happen on their own, making their own way uh, for it to work out. And so she was, or um, his, his son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The woman, the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above, now he's talking about heaven. And remember, if you just, if you remember in Hebrews 12, we just read that we are not children of this place on the mountain that can be touched. We are we are those who have come to this place, this heavenly Jerusalem, this city of God that is eternal, this part of this unshakable kingdom. He says, the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more than more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. And now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. And it's the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. The one thing I don't want you to try and take from that, because if you read Galatians, you'll see this is not what Paul means. But taken out of context, you could get the wrong idea and be like, get rid of the unbeliever, you know, down with the infidel. Like, that's different religion. That's not us. Um, we are people of freedom in the spirit. Proclaim that gospel, that good news to those. And, and all, even, even those who are of that other kind can be redeemed and, and brought into it with us. That's the whole point he's making in Galatians is that if you choose to be under the law, there's nothing but slavery and death for you in it. There's nothing but a really solid set of examples of why you're not good enough on your own. But if you turn to the freedom of the spirit, if you, if you submit yourself to Christ, if you identify with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection and baptism, if you uh, allow yourself to be spiritually crucified with Christ and identify with him in the resurrection and to attain to the glory of his resurrection, there is freedom and all who put faith in Christ can have that freedom. That's not just for some special class of believer or those who are never part of the, some other way. It's for anyone who would turn to Christ and call him Lord. All who put faith in him can be saved. That's what he's talking about, that there's this, this earthly way, this fleshly way, this, this physical concept of, of doing it on your own that leads to death, leads to slavery, leads to brokenness, leads to not enough. It doesn't get you there. And then there's this way of surrender that moves us straight past all these things to this place of holiness and deliverance and freedom in Christ. There's a, a physical and a spiritual, and there's, there's the impermanent, which feels solid to us, and then there's the eternal. We are citizens and ambassadors. We're not just citizens. We are called to also share and speak of, be ambassadors of this kingdom. And it is a kingdom that is not of this world. It's not about like, hey, you need to speak English and be an American. It's not, hey, you need to speak English and be Brit. It's not, hey, you need to speak Chinese and move to China. Like, it's not any of the, it has nothing to do with any earthly kingdom. 
Every tribe, every tongue, every nation will confess that Jesus is Lord. Every knee will bow. There is one true king. And there will be a day where whether anybody followed him or not here, everyone will bow before him in the end. Those who choose before they get to that point to put faith and and declaration of Christ as Lord, they will enter with us into that heavenly, eternal, unshakable kingdom. So coming back around to the beginning of what we read just now, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched. You didn't come to a place that is burning with fire to darkness and gloom and storm. Like That sounds a little terrifying, yeah? And if you read Exodus where this happens, like it, it was terrifying. They were freaking out. The people were not stoked on this. Um, in Exodus chapter 19, uh, if you're at all familiar with um, where, does anybody know there's something significant in chapter 20 of Exodus? Anybody? The Ten Commandments. That's where you get the Ten Commandments for the first time. Somebody said that maybe. I might have heard it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Mariah. Ten Commandments. Before that, Moses has to go up on the mountain to get them. And then while he's up there, there's a whole lot of chapters, so it almost feels like it's not the same event, but Moses goes up on the mountain. He's getting the Ten Commandments. God's telling him all this stuff about how he's supposed to run everything. He's getting instructions for the priesthood and all this stuff. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's got his tablets. And then if you fast forward to Exodus 32, he comes down off the mountain finally. It's been 40 days he's been up there. And he finally comes down off the mountain and Israel is like, throwing a crazy pagan party around a golden calf that they formed, and they're worshiping a golden calf that they made out of melted jewelry. And Moses is like, you done messed up, Aaron. And he throws down the tablets, and um, the guy, like God just finished telling him how like Aaron and his descendants forever are going to be the holy priesthood for Israel. And then he gets there, and Aaron's like leading the way. like, Dude, what are you doing? I was gone for like a month. Calm down. Like you could see me up here. The whole top of the mountain's exploding on a daily basis. And you're over here just like, wee, dumb. <clears throat> but here, here's part of why Israel freaked out and, and why this is not the mountain that we come to. We, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, Exodus 19, starting in verse 12, says this. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. And so after Moses had come down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. And then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. Even like He's like, don't do anything. Like just completely like just isolate, holy, holy sanctify yourselves. That's what the word I was looking for. Uh, holyfy is not a word. Um, sorry. Huh. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, and everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace as the whole mountain trembled violently. At the sound of the trumpet, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. And then it continues and he ends up receiving the Ten Commandments and, and all these teachings and commandments. But that's the scene that the writer of Hebrews is referencing to a people who are very familiar with that account. They all know what cowards their ancestors were. Because if you read through Exodus, like they start seeing what God can do. And Moses is like, hey, God's calling us to all go up the mountain and he's going to tell us how it's going to be from now on. And they're like, yeah, no, we're good. We do not want that at all. And that's when God says, great, put a boundary. You change your mind, you die. You said you don't want this. You can't have it now. You said you don't want it now. You can't have it. 
Why would God be so mean that he would destroy me just for being selfish and just like changing my mind every five seconds and doing what I want? I do what I want. It's like our whole world right now. Why would God be so mean? How could a loving God send me to hell? No, he'll give you what you want. You want to rebel and abandon him and, and decide that there is no God and decide that there's nothing that he has for you that you could possibly want? Okay, you can have that if you want it. You can have exactly that. Don't complain about it when you get it from him. Don't be the two-year-old that screams and yells and throws a fit for the thing, and then when you get the thing you just asked for, you throw a bigger fit. And all the parents said amen. Okay. We have not come, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire. You are not being called up to a place that it has smoke billowing out and has violence and darkness and gloom and storm. You are not being called to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. They straight tell Moses, please don't let him speak to us anymore. You go talk to him. And then you tell us. We don't want to hear that. It's scary. Because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. They could not even process the holiness. But the thing is, is that boundary was set after they rejected it. They were invited in at first, and they said no. And then he gave them a really clear boundary. It was kind of like, it was kind of like the the spiritual, you know, or like real life equivalent too, but like it was like a life or death version of those spikes at like the exit for the rental place or, you know, like a lot of the, I think even one of the state beaches has those. But like, you know, you're driving and it's like, okay, from this point, don't back up. It will shred your tires. You can drive over it this way. No problem. You were invited in. Come on in. Now, too late. You can't back up. You can't undo this part. You're on the side you chose. There's no way to go from here. They didn't want it. They freaked out about it. You're not even being called to that. That was just physical stuff. They didn't even want to process or understand or, or, or approach the spiritual holiness of God. They just wanted the, the version of Moses giving it to them. The sight was so terrifying that even Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you, you're, you're, not, you're not like that. In, in 2 Corinthians Paul, again, um, Paul writes that there was this time where Moses would go up on the mountain or he would go into the tabernacle and he would meet with God face to face and he would come away and his face would be glowing. And then he would hide that, like both when he showed it to the Israelites, it was terrifying to them, so they would freak out. And then he would keep his face veiled so that it wouldn't scare them. But then he also kept the veil on because he didn't want to acknowledge that the glory kept fading and he'd have to go back and get more. He'd have to go meet with God again for the glowing thing to happen. He, he didn't like that it faded away. And Paul says, we who with unveiled faces are always re reflecting the Lord's glory with ever incre increasing glory. We are being transformed from glory to glory. We are being given daily an opportunity to display even more of the glory of the Lord to the world around us. We with shining faces of spiritual power and holiness should be ambassadors of this kingdom, speaking of this supernatural God who created the universe and yet calls us into a personal relationship with him and calls us together as the corporate church to be his body in this world. And some of y'all are a kidney, and I'm sorry for that, but, um, but we're all called to be part of this thing together. I'm joking about the kidneys are important. Okay, um, just seeing if you're awake. But you, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You guys remember that song, Echo Holy? A million angels fall face down on the floor, forever singing holy is the Lord. Like, that's this. To the church of the firstborn, 
Israel is called God's firstborn, meaning those who fully inherit it, inherit, not saying like they were the first ones, they were first in line, so they get something special. It's not saying like, ooh, you're, you're getting to come hang out with the, like the firstborns. You get the, you know, the oldest kid, you know, whatever, like I'm the oldest kid. And so like, I don't, it's not like special privileges for that. It's talking about like, you are heirs to the throne of heaven. Jesus has called us as heirs to his throne called us to inherit glory with him. You've come to this. You've come to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. There's so much in all of these things, but just to kind of expand out some of these things, they're all throughout scripture. In Revelation 5, 11 and 12, um, John the Apostle, uh, John the Evangelist, is um, is transported, and he says, I don't know whether in the spirit or in the body, but like I had this moment, and I'm standing in the throne room of heaven, and I'm seeing all of this, and he says, and then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000, a million angels fall, okay, that's well over a million if you can math. I can't math. Um, I quit math. I wanted to do engineering, and then I don't like math, so I didn't do that. Um, yeah, me too. Okay. Um, my eighth grader's like, yeah, I am not an engineer either. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> Revelation 5. Tens and 10,000 times 10,000 angels, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. So there's just angels everywhere as far as the eye can see. And in a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain, Jesus. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. When he, when he says, when the writer says, you have come to this place of thousands and thousands of angels in joyful assembly, this, this is the kind of thing the writer of Hebrews is talking about. Like, you've come to this place. You didn't come to this terrifying place of like exploding mountaintops and like certain death. You've come to something so much greater. You've come straight to the source of why that was destroying and annihilating a mountaintop. You, you, but you get to go right to it because it's, it's not, it's not just this like, woo, big light show is that the, the living God who created the heavens and the earth and who just with the sound of his voice can shake mountain ranges. Tectonic plates got nothing on Jesus. Like you come straight to him who with the same voice that can shake the earth to its core speaks forgiveness and blessing and love and mercy to you. Oh, he is the one who is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and, and praise forever. We, we come alongside all those, the firstborn, the ones who are chosen to be the inheritors of the kingdom of heaven alongside Christ. That does not mean, like the Mormons believe, that we become gods. That does not mean that. It does not mean that somehow we become like him in that like we attain some sort of God nature. That's not it. We don't become little gods. We don't anything. But we receive the blessing and the, the status of absolute adoption and, and childhood in Christ. Alongside those whose names are written in heaven in, in Luke, when Jesus sends out a bunch of disciples to go and, and proclaim the gospel, the good news that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and, and he says, and, and back up those words. When you say like the kingdom of heaven is at hand, say, and the son of man can forgive sins. And when people are like, yeah, bet. And he's like, okay, like heal the sick, cure those who can't walk, cast out demons, make the blind see, make the deaf hear. And they come back and they're like, Jesus, we did all the things. It was amazing. Even the demons had to listen to us. We were casting out demons left and right. It was incredible. And he's like, yeah, good for you. And they're like, well, why are you so like down about it? And he's like, don't rejoice that the demons listen to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Luke 10, 20. 
Don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Your name is written in heaven if you have put your faith in Christ. There's a, a ledger, a roster, you're on it, written in the blood of the living God who shed his blood. I mean, it, oh, man, I wish there was something worth preaching here. Um, okay. Like, like, this is the kind of message, I'm like sitting here working on this in a chair, and I kept like standing up, like kicking my dog, because I'm like, stand up and push the chair back, and she's sleeping under it, and she's like, Arr! you know, and I'm like, oh, sorry, I just got excited. Yeah. Um, that's so good. Oh. The, the, I just swiped past a bunch of stuff. You've come to God, the judge of all, the one who will judge the living and the dead. You've come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, who is the mediator of a new covenant. Yes, a new covenant. He says that at communion. We're going to take communion at the end of the service in a few minutes. And, and he says um, that, uh, uh, the, that this cup is a new covenant in my blood. No longer this endless series of sacrifices. We've read all about that in Hebrews. It talks about it at length. That just like, what can possibly be done by all of this? But Jesus, who speaks a better covenant, goes, I will be the one and only ultimate sacrifice that's ever needed. I will do this thing. And if you just put faith in me, if you put all of your everything, just like throw your lot in with me, go all in with me, then you can have the forgiveness I'm offering. I will pay for you. And you can have this. The covenant is, by faith in me, you have eternal life and redemption and forgiveness. Which speaks a better word, that sacrifice, the sprinkled blood of Christ, which is a reference to the way that, that uh, altar sacrifices went in the Old Testament where you know they have this altar with like, this big gold box with these angel wings coming over and, and that's the mercy seat. And they would go and there's, all these, uh, there's this altar with horns everywhere and a barbecue and, and they do all the things and they take the blood of the sacrificed animal and the priest goes around like just flicking blood everywhere and, and it's kind of gruesome. But, but that sprinkled blood of Christ, this sacrifice of Christ is better than the blood of Abel. It speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And there's some discrepancy in, in what that means in a lot of the commentary. Some of them talk about the sacrifice that Abel offered that got him killed by his brother. Abel takes his animals and he makes a sacrifice of sprinkled blood and all those things that I was just talking about. And God's like, yes, that was awesome. And then Cain shows up with like some veggies. And he's like, no, that wasn't it. And Cain's like, whatever, you liked his. And he gets all upset. And he gets so mad, and God's like, hey, don't do the thing you're thinking about doing. I can see it in you. Don't do that. And he's like, shut up. What do you know? And he goes and kills his brother. And so there's also the blood of Abel, literally like in the ground, like screaming out for justice. And God says, his blood cries out to me of what you did. Like, you didn't get away with that. I saw it. I know. And his blood is still staining the ground where you're claiming like, I don't know what that is. Like, I know. The blood of Abel, either the sacrifice speaks of man's best attempts at righteousness, but it's temporary, or the injustice of death and, and murder and destruction in this world. Either way, the blood of Christ is, speaks a better word because it speaks totality, finality, it is finished. Whichever way you want to take it, the blood of Christ still says it is finished. It's paid in full. Accept this payment and it's all good. So see to it, therefore, based on all of these things, see to it then that you do not refuse him who speaks, the one who says it is finished. Don't refuse him. He said it's finished. Don't be like, man, I don't know. I think I like this part where I have to do all these things and it never really works out. I like that. It's fun. No, it isn't. Don't do that. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth... Man, the ones, who, the ones who were warned in person don't, didn't escape. If they didn't escape when he was just on earth telling them, if they didn't escape then, how much more will we not escape? How much less will we escape if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? Man, his voice shook and all of that. And it just said that, the, the thing about the, the mountain shaking and trembling and the people hearing it. And it says like trumpets and then like, boom, the voice of God. And everyone's like, ah! And like, they can't, 
They can't take it. They couldn't handle just hearing that that was happening up there. They went and threw this massive party because they couldn't stand to hear what was coming from the mountain. They wanted nothing to do with listening to the voice of God. They wanted momentary forgetfulness, but they find themselves rejected from acting that way. And there was a time where his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised it's going to go bigger than that. Now, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens, like everything. There's not going to be a place to go. There's nowhere you can go to get away from that. Like God is going to have his way. Get on board. Come to this place where you're confidently approached. It says earlier in Hebrews, we can, therefore we can confidently approach because the high priest who has paid the way for us is still there on our behalf. Jesus is still at the right hand of God speaking on our behalf. His blood speaks a better word that we have access to the Father, even though we are unworthy. He's going to shake and remove all the created things so that what cannot be shaken may may remain. And again, Paul, 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about Love and he, and he gives this beautiful description of what love is and it's patient and it's kind and it's good and it trusts and it hopes and it, it believes things and it doesn't boast and it's not full of itself and it, it seeks to uplift others and, and it's just amazing. And, and he says, right now we only see and hear like glimpses, just a little part of what it's gonna be. It's like looking through my glasses right now where there's like so much smudging, I cannot get the right cloth to like wipe these off. I even tried the Norwex cloth. And it, like I still have smudges all over and like crazy glare right now and I can barely see like half the room. And it just, but there will be a day where it's just like looking without any hindrance at all that we will see God face to face, not just this like dim, like scuffed up window view. Right now, it's like looking through a dirty window out from outside. You know, you're trying to look into a dark place from the outside, and all you see is your reflection staring at you around your hands. But then, and when all these things fade away, prophecy is going to fade, and tongues are going to cease, and all, all this stuff is going to go away. And in the end of all of it, three things will remain, faith, hope, and love. God's going to shake out everything else. But we are part of a kingdom that's built on faith, hope, and love. We are part of a kingdom that is built on eternal things that cannot be shaken. Therefore, since we are receiving this kingdom, since we are inheritors, since we have been counted alongside the firstborn whose names are written in heaven, since we are those who receive the inheritance that Christ has offered, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He is the one who destroyed the top of the mountain. He is the one that was the fear of Jacob. He is the one who is the terror of those who would not turn to him. But he's also the one who poured out the blood of his son that all who believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Let us worship him in reverence and awe. Just awesome wonder. I just think of that, the beauty of, of a Revelation song when it just really tries to capture that moment of just like filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the, at the power of your name, the beauty of your name, the majesty of your name. The writer of Hebrews directly quotes Deuteronomy Moses writing back about all the things that had happened in Exodus and everything, he says, our God is a consuming fire. Therefore, let us, since we're receiving this kingdom that can't be shaken, let us be thankful and worship. Okay. We're done? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, therefore, I urge you, Romans 12. Let me give you a couple things to just bring us together in this. This is, Hear this as we prepare ourselves for communion. Hear this as we consider, I think most of you know Jesus. Great. Maybe some of you don't. Great. Here's a chance. I urge you, brothers and sisters, as Paul says in Romans 12, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Sing in here. That's like step negative one. It's like not barely a beta test. Worship in here is the very beginning. Go out there and live a life of worship. Live a life of sacrifice. Lay all of your desires and fears and, and hopes and dreams on the altar. Give them all over to Christ and see what he does with it and live it continually as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. That's your act of worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. You will know his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is all through Christ. Have you offered yourself as a living sacrifice? And, and if you're wondering, like, why would I do that? Well, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors in Hebrews 1, the beginning of this letter that we've been reading. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he'd provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He provided purification for sins. The whole gospel piece, the big picture piece of it is, there is a God who made you in his image. He created you for good things. You, like every other human who has ever lived, live to some degree in rebellion, and that rebellion earns you death to a degree that you cannot possibly pay the tab. Without the sacrifice of Christ, there is no salvation. Without declaration of Christ as Lord, there is no forgiveness. Without Christ, there is no hope. If you would put your faith in Christ, there is absolute forgiveness and redemption. You don't do it. He did it. You just receive it. You declare allegiance to it. You continually take the crown back off your head and give it back to him. Because every day we're real good at putting those things on ourselves. And God did this out of love. John 3, 16 and 17. There's this classic thing. It's on everything. It's on, I mean, Tebow wore it on his eye makeup. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The gospel is not about condemnation, it's about salvation. Hell is not a special punishment for you. It's not even meant for you. It's just where you choose to go by denying Christ. It's where you choose to run off to because spiritually, eternally, we're like toddlers trying to run out into the street chasing a ball. And God's just going, like, come back. I have better things for you than getting hit by that. Come over here. Don't choose destruction. Come this way. So we have up here, even gluten free, the body and blood of Christ. And I want to ask that everybody get into groups of two or three, come forward, grab the elements as you're ready. And in just a moment, I want to give a, a bit of a benediction for us as we, as we go into this. But the, um, as soon as we, uh, we're going to sing just a verse and chorus of nothing but the blood. And, um, and then... Come forward, grab a couple people. If you see somebody by themselves that doesn't have somebody else with them, invite them to join you. Don't do this alone. Communion, community. Together. It's not a solo sport. Not a solo activity. Maybe you don't feel worthy of it today. God's love has proved to us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You're worthy. Because God made you in his image and he sent his son to die for you so that you could be redeemed. 
if you put faith in him. The only thing that disqualifies you from it is if you don't trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, then don't do this. It's not snack time. This is a holy moment of receiving the body and blood of Christ together that by his sacrifices we are healed. By his blood we are set free. Take a, take a minute to, to, to pray and, and consider to, to once again lay everything down at the foot of the cross. And If you need to pray, if you need to take some time, grab a couple people and do that. But as we go into that, can we um, sing this hymn? Do we have those? His words. There we go. You can sing with me if you like. But to open our time of prayer. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No. Other found I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Thank you, Lord. Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ.